All right, we're going to go into our scripture reading today, which comes from John chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. We'll be reading this in the ESV, and so uh, you can grab one of those pew Bibles. Those should be ESVs, or you can find the passage in uh, a Bible or a Bible app that you happen to have. Um, we're going to do an alternate reading, which means that I'll read the first verse, and everyone will respond with the verse after that, and we'll keep going back and forth until the end. And so once you have found the scripture, we ask that you please stand as able for the reading of God's word. So again, uh, this is John chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. May the Lord bless the reading of God's word for us. When he had gone out, Jesus said, now is the son of man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. All right. Well, we are continuing uh, the sermon series, this Easter sermon series on resurrecting. And so today is called Resurrecting the Christian. You know, the word Christian is one that is used a lot. And uh, it's the word that we use to identify ourselves, uh, if you happen to be a follower of Jesus. Uh, but I wanted to talk about that word a little bit, because I think it's kind of lost meaning. What is a Christian today? Uh, so, you know, Christian it can be generally applied to, you know, people who follow Christianity, for sure. Um, but, you know, being a Christian and the connotations of it had changed over time. There was a time where uh, being a Christian, you know, maybe like a generation or maybe even a generation or two ago, being a Christian used to be a synonymous with being a good person. So for example, you know, someone might say something like this, like, well, I would never cheat you. I'm a Christian, right? And, and someone would be like, well, it makes sense, right? You're a Christian. You're not going to cheat me, right? Nowadays, when you say I'm a Christian, does that automatically make you think that that person is a good person? Does it? I wonder, you know, for those of you who grew up in the church, maybe you're like, yeah, duh, a Christian is a good person. But maybe for people not in the church, that's not what immediately comes up. Oftentimes when you ask people now, what do you think of when you hear the word Christian? A lot of people have this word that comes up. Do you know what it is? It's, it's usually the first word that people think of. They say judgmental. Interesting, isn't it? Right? What is a Christian? And by the way, there's like tens of thousands of different Christian denominations. You know, there's so many Christians. I think Christian, Christianity is still uh, the largest religion in the world. Uh, but it's so diverse that there are many Christian sects or denominations that would even say things like, well, we're real Christians, but those people over there, they're not real Christians. And so even amongst Christians, there's not even a agreement on what a Christian is, right? But it does seem like the, the key word in Christian is Christ, right? And for me, being a Christian is being like a little Christ. But I want to kind of look at some of the ways that we normally think of being a Christian. And maybe the ways that Jesus actually thinks we're supposed to be a Christian. So uh, I just looked it up on my phone. <laughs> and so when I typed in Christian definition, this is what came up. This is what Google told me. Uh, so, so the first one is an adjective. It's just, you know, like Christian music, right? Relating to or prof professing Christianity or its teachings. But the noun is a person who has received Christian baptism or is a believer in Christianity. And I think that is what most people think a Christian is, right? Google definitely thinks that, that a, a, a Christian is a believer in Christ, a believer in the Christian religion. But my question is, is that what a Christian normally was? And so you may know that Jesus never used the word Christian, uh, but Christian, uh, the word Christian appears in the Bible and appears in three different verses. I'm going to just show you the very first one. 
And so this is, comes from Acts chapter 11, verses 25 through 26. And it tells us about Barnabas and, and um, Saul going to Antioch. And they spent a year there meeting with the church and teaching people. And we're told in, in, in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. So according to this, according to the Bible, the first account of a Christian, what is a Christian? What is a Christian? A disciple. Okay, good. <laughs> you guys are paying attention. Yeah. In Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. In other words, the word Christian is just another word for a disciple, right? That's the way it was originally intended. So my question is, what is a disciple? What does Jesus expect? What, what does it mean to be someone who follows Jesus? Now, uh, so when you think about it this way, um, a Christian is a Christian, someone who is like Christ, right? It's like if you were <laughs> trying to be like Steve, we might call you a steve -Ann. And what would it mean to be a steve -Ann? If you were to be like Steve, would you dress like Steve? Get glasses like Steve? You know, strangely wear slacks year round like Steve? Some of you may know that uh, for 20 years I didn't wear jeans. I recently started wearing jeans. Uh, and, and so some people, they, they look at me like, like I, don't, I don't wear them on Sundays, but you know, they see me on a Saturday. And some people are like, Pastor Steve, there's something different. I don't, I don't, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> so I didn't wear jeans for 20 years, you know, but recently, like my, my wife, it was like a major wife win for her when she got me to, she, she bought me a pair of jeans and I would actually wear them. Anyways, would this mean that you don't wear jeans for 20 years <laughs> if you're a Steve Ann? Would you talk like Steve? Would you have corny dad jokes like Steve? What would it mean? Would, would you sort of part your hair like me? You know, not comb your hair like me. <laughs> what would that mean to be a Steve Ann? What does it mean to be a, a Christy Ann? To be like Jesus? Because that's what it means to be a disciple. Now, very helpfully in this passage, Jesus tells us exactly what that's like. But I want to give you a modern translation of this passage. This is not the typical translation, but we kind of helpfully interpreted what most of us think a Christian is. So let's take a look. A new commandment I give to you, that you believe that I died for you so you can go to heaven after you die. Also, go to a building where a guy will talk about me, and you will sing songs about me once a week for about an hour and a half, give or take. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you believe and call yourself a Christian. Also, be very passionate about a couple key political issues that people who would identify as Christians tell you is really important, and you can pretty much ignore the rest. Now, obviously, that's not what the Bible says. <laughs> but isn't this what we think Christians are? Oftentimes in America, we think a Christian is just someone who believes, right? Let's go back just to our uh, Google definition. A person who has received Christian baptism or is a believer in Christianity. Nowhere here do you actually see someone who does, someone who lives like Christ. You don't see that anywhere. Right? And so in, in my little tongue-in-cheek <laughs> translation, right? Maybe it started off and you're like, wait, 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 wait. When did you realize that I changed this? Was it when I said, and also go to a building where a guy will talk about me and you will sing songs about me once a week? Right? You probably realize you're like, wait, wait, wait. This isn't the Bible. This isn't what Jesus said. Right? But did you think that this was the Bible when it says, a new commandment I give to you, that you believe that I died for you so you can go to heaven after you die. This is what we think it means to be a Christian. This is what we think it means to be a disciple. Now, brothers and sisters, I don't think there's anything wrong with believing in Jesus and going to heaven after you die. And by the way, uh, that we need to nuance a little bit, but I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But what I will say is that's not what Jesus said. That's not what makes you a disciple. According to Jesus, not according to Steve, okay? But according to Jesus, that does not make you a disciple. This is what makes you a disciple. So um, if you see 34 and 35 here, it says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. 
Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Jesus says it three times, in case you didn't get it at first. So what does it mean to be a disciple? A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my, dis my disciples. If what? If you believe in me? If you go to church? No, if you love one another. Now, brothers and sisters, this was important to define Christianity in this way, to define what it means to be a disciple in this way. Because everything that the disciples understood that what it meant to be a disciple was about to change. Now, some of you may know that the word Christian, because it's come to mean so many different things, that there's been this movement to kind of reclaim that word. And so a lot of people, they, they say something like, okay, well, being a Christian is just, it's not worth the money it's printed on anymore, right? Just anyone can call themselves a Christian. So nowadays I hear a lot of people say, oh, oh, you know, I'm a Christ follower. I'm not a Christian, I'm a Christ follower. Right? And that's actually pretty accurate to what a disciple was. They followed Jesus around and they listened to him as he taught them. And then they learned actually what it meant to be like Jesus, to actually do what Jesus did. So what, what people know about uh, rabbis is, uh, so you know, a lot of people consider Jesus a rabbi. It, it was a teacher. Uh, who learned to interpret the scripture, maybe from a certain school of thought or a certain point of view, and he would have disciples, students. That's what a disciple means. It's a student. It's an apprentice, right? So not only are you learning, but an apprentice, the, the, the idea is that one day you will become the rabbi. So one day you will have to do what the rabbi does. And this is why you have very strange passages where Peter jumps out of a boat and tries to walk on the water. Why? because his rabbi did it, right? And so if the rabbi could walk on the water, then the expectation is I would walk on the water, right? And so the idea is we're gonna follow around Jesus, learn from Jesus, and someday learn to do like Jesus. That's what it meant to be a disciple. But there was a shift. And, and, and if you read this passage in context, what you find is that this was shared right before Jesus goes to the cross. And so what he's talking about here, he says, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. He's talking about his death and resurrection. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I, say, I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. Why is that important? Because what it means to be a disciple is about to change. Why? Because the physical Jesus, the flesh and blood Jesus, the rabbi Jesus who walked uh, the, the, the hills and plains and deserts of Palestine would no longer be with the people. He just wouldn't be there anymore, right? So he's telling them, literally, you cannot follow me the way you once followed me. You cannot follow me around in my footsteps, right? You can't do that. But what it means to be a disciple now is that you do what I did, right? And specifically, if you want to know exactly what it means to be a Christ follower, a disciple of me, it means to love like me. Brothers and sisters, let's be honest. When you think of a Christian, when anyone thinks of a Christian, you may even be a Christian, how many of you think that a Christian is somebody who loves like Jesus Christ? Let's be honest, right? I mean, oftentimes, it, 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 I understand that, you know, during our praise, we are praising Jesus, right? We are praising God, you know, and we talk a lot about God's love. And we talk about, a lot about God loving us and us loving God. And by the way, it's kind of weird because aren't we supposed to be loving God? But it's so many of the songs are about how God loves us, which I understand. It, it's just good to kind of set the tone, right? But very, very infrequently, it's so hard. Uh, Jason and I and the priest team, we work to kind of pick songs that will kind of fit the sermon. And oftentimes when there are, are sermons about loving like Jesus, we can't find any songs. <laughs> right now, now, again, you may be like, but it's praise, right? It's all about loving Jesus, right? But we have no problem singing about how much God loves us, right? 
but we never really sing about how we are supposed to love one another, right? I mean, you even hear people say things like, oh, I love Jesus, I just don't like people, <laughs> you know? Or, you know, like people talk about Jesus, like, oh yeah, I love Jesus, I love Jesus so much, but that girl at my work, mm, she's annoying. Right? We have no problems with that. There's been times where I've been in my car listening to songs about Jesus, praying Jesus, and then someone cuts me off. And the words that come out of my mouth <laughs> are probably not the words that would have come out of Jesus' mouth. Right? The gestures that come from my fingers are probably not the gestures that would have come from Jesus' fingers, if you get my drift. Right? Brothers and sisters, what does it mean to be a Christian? to love like Jesus, to love one another just as I have loved you. Verse 34, one more time, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. Sometimes we think Christians are rule followers. We're just supposed to follow the laws, right? Follow the laws about God, right? Don't violate what God tells you not to do. Brothers and sisters, is that a new commandment? I don't think that's a new commandment. I think that's a very old command. That's, that's just Judaism, right? Follow the commandments. Don't make God mad, right? Just, just that, that's the old style of religion that Jesus, I think, was coming to revolutionize. That's why he says a new commandment. And so the Jews knew very well um, how to be zealous for God, how to love God, how to praise God, how to follow his laws. Well, they tried anyhow, right? There's nothing new about that. But for Christians, we have to take seriously that Jesus is saying, this is a new commandment. I understand the old style of religion is about following a bunch of laws, right? Like, like, don't do bad stuff. Don't do bad stuff. And isn't that what a lot of us think? Like, even, like, that's kind of the second layer of Christianity. Believe in Jesus and don't do bad things. Right? Don't sin. Right? Now, I would also agree with that. You shouldn't sin. But for what purpose? This, the, the, the not sinning is supposed to be in purpose of this. This is not supposed to be in the purpose of not sinning. Does that make sense? This is a new way of living. As a Christ follower, I'm going to give you a new way of life. It is not just about following a bunch of laws, right? It's not about uh, just regulating your behavior and just trying to be moral and ethical. It is about love. It is about loving one another. And, you know, I think on some level, we used to get this. There was a very old song, Christian song, called, They'll Know We Are Christians by Our Belief by our ethical standards, by our political stances? No. They'll know we are Christians by our love. And when you hear the song, it kind of sounds like very hippie-ish. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. Da -da 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 and they'll know we are Christians by our love. Can you just imagine people just around a campfire, holding hands, just spinning around in a circle? They'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. They'll know. Right? We look at that. We're like, you know, that's for hippies. Brothers and sisters, this is the words of Jesus. This is what it means to be a Christian. This is what it means to be a Christ follower, to love just as I have loved you. That's it. That's the sermon. <laughs> you know, but how do we do that? So I, I want to show you this picture. And I, I cut off the caption for it. It's kind of faded, but can you see it's like a little boy looking at a picture of Jesus, right? And I took out the caption because I didn't want to confuse you. But the caption is what most of us think. Um, you know, when you're like, okay, okay, Pastor Steve, I understand. A Christian is supposed to be like Christ. It just makes sense, right? So how do you do that? And this is what most of us think. The caption says, I'm trying to be like Jesus. How do you be like Jesus? How do you try to be like Jesus? Now, if you're paying attention, you love like Jesus, right? But for a lot of us, it's just become very abstract. Should this young man uh, get rid of his uh, smart little sweater and his polo shirt that's underneath and trade it for, you know, a tunic and a robe? 
<laughs> Should he grow out his facial hair a little bit? You know, get some, you know, that Jesus beard going, you know, grow out his hair a little bit, you know? What does it mean to be, if you're going to be like Steve, you know, to be a steve <laughs> you know? And we ask that question. Now, what about this, brothers and sisters? What if you dressed like me, if you acted like, or sorry, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe even, um, you know, said that you, you uh, believed in some of the things that I believed, but you didn't act in any way the way that I act? Would you be a steve <laughs> Would we be a Christian if we just dressed like Jesus? We said we believed the things of Jesus, but we didn't even act like Jesus. I think, brothers and sisters, this is why Jesus doesn't talk that much about beliefs, because beliefs are cheap. And, and when you look at, at James, uh, uh, Jesus' little brother, when he's talking about faith, he says faith without actions, without deeds, it's completely meaningless. I'm paraphrasing there. James says, faith without actions is dead. It's not faith at all. So you can say you believe in these things, but if your actions don't back it up, then it's nothing, right? Brothers and sisters, this is going to be too long of a message to explain how you do that. But I will say this, it's not just about focusing on your behavior. Behavior is a big part of it. But it's also becoming the kind of person who will naturally love the way that Jesus loves. Right? And this is our goal, to become a Christian. To learn to love like Jesus means to learn to be like Jesus. So in other words, uh, as it says in Scripture, uh, bad trees do not produce good food, fruit, right? Good fruit, uh, sorry, good trees do not produce bad fruit. Just kind of makes sense, right? And so for most of us, when we hear messages like this, all we're focused on is the fruit. It's all we're focused on. And this is the problem when you do kind of sin management. They're like, oh, don't do bad things, right? Try to be like Jesus, right? All you're kind of focused on is what's coming out of you. And what we should be more concerned about is what is inside of us. Now, when Jesus was loving people, do you think he was like, you know what? Like, God bless you, woman. Like, there's a woman, she she's, has this internal bleeding for years, and people are judging her because she reached out and touched Jesus. And Jesus is like, hey, don't judge her, right? Like, like have compassion. It's like, it's, you know, daughter, you are healed. Rise up. Do you think inside he's like, Man, what a pathetic woman. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Do you think Jesus was thinking that? No, of course not. Right? I think Jesus through and through was compassion. Jesus through and through was the kind of person who would naturally want to heal this woman. That's just who Jesus was. Right? Sometimes for Christians, we can play this game. Right? And this is why it was one of Jesus's, uh, I don't want to say favorite, but it was unique. The, the word that he used, that he tossed out, that for many of us it has become a bad word. It's just a, a word that describes a lot of religious people. He used the word hypocrite. And usually we think of hypocrite as fake. But if you've ever heard me preach on this, hypocrite in the Greek usage, it just means actor. That's all it means. It means you're wearing a mask. It means that you are acting a certain way, but that's not who you really are, right? And for Jesus, through and through, and he was very clear about this, good tree cannot produce bad fruits. Bad tree cannot produce good fruits. Sure, you can act like it, but after a while, <laughs> you're going to know. You're going to know that that fruit is really rotten. After a while, the real fruits that is supposed to come out of the kind of tree you are will come out. And by the way, it is exhausting to be an actor, right? It is so hard to be someone you're not. It is so hard not to live in your integrity. And integrity just means that you are an integrated person. Your actions match what's inside of you. And so brothers and sisters, we're like, hey, be nice to people. Just love people, right? But if you do not have love in your heart, how hard is it going to be to actually love people? 
Right? Be forgiving of people. Yeah, you should forgive them. And brothers and sisters, I believe that. But if you do not have forgiveness in your heart, how hard is it going to be to be forgiving towards people? Be patient. But if inside you is impatience, right, then patience will not come out of you. Right? And so the work of the Christian, of the Christ follower, is to put yourself in a position where the Holy Spirit can start changing your inside. Right? This is a part of the reason why we pray. This is part of the reason why we pause our day to say, hey, let's take stock of how we're living. So much in this world, we just go, 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 go. And we don't take a moment to pause and say, what what are we even doing here? I think that's what we're supposed to be doing here at church is to pause and to say, hey, are we living up to the way that we're supposed to? This is why we do the prayer of repentance every week. Right? It's a moment for us to say, hey, we have not loved as you wanted us to love. In fact, let's actually go back real quick here to the, the prayer of repentance. Right? We confess to you and to one another that we've sinned against you by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not fully loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not always had in us the mind of Christ. And this is the part that I think is very interesting. We've used this prayer before, a form of it, but we didn't have the part that said the mind of Christ. We just focused on the behavior, right? We haven't loved our neighbors as ourselves. But how can you love like Jesus if you don't have Jesus' mind and heart? And this is what I desire more than anything else, not to just tweak my behavior, but to change my mind, to change my heart, to become the kind of person that can actually love like Jesus. Throughout this summer, we're going to be talking about this. We're going to talk about, um, we're going to do a sermon series over the summer, and I'm just going to call it practical. (laughs) A lot of people are like, oh, you know, that sermon wasn't very practical. Well, we're going to try really hard to make it very practical. You know, what are ways that you can actually take on the mind of Christ, right? But the one thing that I will say is, okay, I'll say two things. (laughs) One is pause, pause. Don't just assume you're doing it, right? We have to create room for God to work in us. That's repentance, to pause and say, okay, we haven't been doing it. We haven't been hitting the mark, right? And of course, the goal of this is not to beat yourself up and to feel all guilty and ashamed because that's not going to change anything, right? God doesn't want you to feel guilty and ashamed all the time, but he does want you to have his heart, to learn to be like him. And you will never learn to be like him if you don't recognize that you're not like him now, right? And so this is prayer to say, God, I need your help. I need your help. I can't do this on my own. I'm not like you, at least not completely. How many of us can claim that you have loved like this completely this week? You have loved like Jesus. Not me, I have to put my hand down. I haven't loved exactly like Jesus, right? And so we have to create room for the Holy Spirit to work within us. It's going to be next week's message. We're going to talk about what the Holy Spirit does and how we can access that more, right? But number one, pause. And number two, let's not make this more difficult or convoluted than it has to be, right? Jesus focuses on one thing here, only one thing. And so I want to encourage you. I, I, there are other things you can do in Christianity. But what is the most important? According to Jesus, how will people know you are his follower, his disciple? I know we repeated it so many times, but it's worth looking at one more time, right? The verse 34 there. Um, the, the, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. So let's narrow our focus here for a moment. Let's make this about loving one another. Now, I I, I did say that just changing your behavior is not necessarily going to change your inside. But brothers and sisters, I think that if you can approach it from both ends, try to tweak the behavior while tweaking the inside. You know, one of the things that we, we find is that your thoughts, your emotions, and your actions are all tied together. 
This is one of the things that you learn if you've ever uh, learned anything about cognitive behavioral therapy. This is the, the most popular form of therapy uh, in this country. And the idea is your thoughts, your emotions, and your actions, they're all tied together. If you pull a thought, the emotions will move a little bit. So will the thoughts. If you, if you uh, sorry, the, the, the behaviors. If you pull a behavior, your emotions and your thinking will also get tweaked a little bit. But the problem is if you're only changing the behavior, but the rest of you is not willing to change, then you become disintegrated. Does that make sense? So just the recognition that you are not living completely in line with your beliefs, I mean, that's just a reality that most of us live in. Most of us are disintegrated. But the problem is when you become willingly disintegrated, right? When you say, you know what, I, I don't really love this person, but I'm going to act like I love that person, right? That's a hypocrite, right? You know, I, I'm, I'm going to, you know, just say that I do these things, but I'm not going to actually do it. It is a different story to say, I'm not doing this currently. I don't actually love like Jesus uh, desires me to, but I want to. I want to. So I'm going to start living into my values of trying to love like Jesus. And I'm going to pray and hope that as I do that, that my thoughts and my emotions and what I really believe will get pulled along with me. Does that make sense? So I'm not saying don't try, but don't just try to change your behavior. You have to allow God to change your inside too. But sometimes learning to love like Jesus is just learning to love like Jesus. Why, why do we have to make it so hard, right? You know, if there's a simple action you can take today to love somebody, I don't know, maybe you see somebody who needs some money, and we make it so complicated. We're like, what would Jesus do? I don't know. Uh, what would a Christian do? Uh, uh. Brothers and sisters, if you think maybe to love like Jesus, to actually give that person some money, then give them some money. Right? I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know, if, if loving someone is to reach out to them and to say hi, <laughs> to be nice to someone. Maybe today, you know, you go to the grocery store and there's a, a cashier and they look all stressed out. And, and you just say a kind word to them. You're like, hey, how's it going today? You know, you, you look at them. You really look at them. That's one of the things that you notice about Jesus. You know, there's times where, like, there, there's somebody who wanted healing from Jesus and, you know, and, and, and actually, Peter and uh, uh, another disciple, they did this too. They, they, they say to this man who needs healing, they say, look at me. And so the guy looks at him because he's like, oh, maybe he's going to give me money, right? And, and he heals that man. He looks at him, and then he heals. How many times do you actually look at people? Maybe you haven't learned the healing part yet, but can you just look at people? Can you listen to people? Can you try to bless people? Blessing is a very simple thing. This is what blessing is. Blessing is desiring God's best for that person. And so learning to love people, I think it starts with that. Because in blessing, you, you can't desire the best for somebody while secretly wanting their destruction, right? It doesn't work that way. You can't bless people when you're like, ah, oh, man, you know, this person needs to go down. When you're plotting their demise, when you're wishing harm on them, that's cursing, right? And so what we know uh, is that there's a, a switch that exists in, in all of us. There's kind of two modes to be towards people, really only two. Are there degrees to this? Maybe, but I think it's more like a, a, a switch. You're either in an a, a attitude and a heart of blessing, which I think is the attitude and heart of Christ, or you're in an attitude and heart of cursing. Sorry, I didn't mean to say these people are blessing, these people are cursing. It's just, I'm just turning to the left and right. <laughs> but there's only two ways of being. Which way of being are you going to be? When someone cuts you off on the road and you're like, ah! I, and back in the day, they might even say, curse you! I know we don't talk like that anymore. It's very old-timey. Curse you! You know? But uh, brothers and sisters, what intention do you have towards that person in your heart? In your mind, right, when someone cuts you off or somebody's mean to you or someone bumps into you in the hallway at school, for those of us who don't drive, 
right? What, what, what is in your heart? What is in your mind? What is your, your, your kind of way of being towards that person? And so, brothers and sisters, I want to end this message. And to me, I think the best way to end this message is to end by blessing people. And so I want you to think of somebody right now that you've had a hard time loving. Did that, my, that name pop into your head? Did that name pop into your head and then you're like, oh, no, no, not that, not that person. Then that's the person, guys. That's the person. All right? So whatever that name was, and you fought it a little bit, the, the name popped in, and then you immediately resisted it. Well, hey, this is great practice, right? You know, that person isn't here. Or are they? Maybe they are. Hey, even more practice. This is great. So now I want you to get up and walk. No, I'm just kidding. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. <laughs> Someone was like, phew. All right. So we got some things to pray about, guys, I think. All right. So think about that person. All right. So I, I want you to do this. Okay. Now, I, I, I said that a part of the way that Jesus loved people, the way that we are supposed to learn to love people is to look at them, right? Oh, okay, <laughs> is to look at them. And so I, you may not be able to look at that person right now if they're not in this room, right? But I want you to close your eyes for a moment. Don't bow your head because you might fall asleep. <laughs> but just, just, just close your eyes. Uh, and, and I want you to picture that person's face. And when you picture that person's face, this is what I try to do when I bless people. This is going to sound kind of funny, but it works. If you want to generate good feelings about someone, picture that person smiling or laughing. Now, laughing for me is easier because I don't know why. It's just a more dramatic look. But I can picture most people that I've met laughing. Can you picture that person laughing or smiling? It's hard to think negative thoughts about someone when you picture them smiling or laughing. Right? That, that's what I've noticed. So just picture that person that's difficult for you to love and picture them smiling or laughing. And then just take a moment to bless them. It's very simple, right? You can just say very simply, Lord, bless them. And what that means is, Lord, I want good things for this person. God, I want your best for this person, right? Do you want good or do you want ill? Do you want bad things to happen to this person or good things to happen to this person, right? Those are the two modes of being. And brothers and sisters, yes, I understand. Maybe for some of us, it doesn't seem like a switch you can just flip. But maybe you can just say in this moment, Lord, this is really hard, but I want to bless them. So can you do that in faith? Lord, I bless them, or Lord, I want to bless them. It's really the only two options you have. <laughs> if you're really not willing, then just admit that as well. But can you still picture their face? Can you picture them smiling or laughing? I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters. This is something I've learned to do. If you are having a hard time with somebody, I want to encourage you to pray for them in this way every day. That, that, that literally takes like 10 seconds, right? Pray for them literally like this every day. And you, if you pray for this person every day for about two months, three months, maybe, I don't know, some of, the, some of these people have just really are on your bad side. <laughs> maybe it's going to take a good solid five months. But brothers and sisters, I can't promise you anything, but I just know from my own experience, something will start to switch within you. Your prayers will start to change. Your attitudes toward them will start to change, right? Now, brothers and sisters, I want you to open your eyes for a second. Now, this is the part that I know, I know, you came to church and you thought you were just coming to hear some guy talk, but that's not church. I don't know what that is. You just hear some guy talk, right? Church is a place where we learn to be the people of God. So I want to encourage you. Maybe it's someone you came with. Maybe it's someone you didn't come with. Can you just look at someone next to you? Just, just look at them for a moment. If it, I know eye contact is a really scary thing. It's going to make you want to laugh. That's great, because now you can picture them laughing. <laughs> Just look at that person real quick, right? You know, if you can hold it for longer than two seconds, that, that would be great. And then <laughs> some of you are doing this a little too well. <laughs> now, now you can look to maybe if there's someone on the other uh, side. If you don't ignore them, give them some love too. Look at them as well. Could you do that in faith? All right, now I want to t take a moment. Brothers and sisters, can you take a moment to bless that person? You know, maybe you don't know what's going on in their life, right? You don't know what God's best is for them. 
but you can just bless them, right? You just saw them probably laughing or smiling. So picture their face. If you need a reminder, just peek over. <laughs> but just take a moment. And, and I know this is weird because they're right there. <laughs> but brothers and sisters, can you just do this in faith? Just close your eyes. Picture their face. Because w- when you leave this place, you won't see them again. Right? At least not till next week, maybe. Um, but just picture their face for a moment. And just bless them. It can just be as simple as these words. Coming from the core of your being, Lord, may you bless so-and-so. Can you bless David? Can you bless Susan? (laughs) Can you bless Esther? Just picture their face. And brothers and sisters, um, I'm going to ask the praise team to come up. I, I want to do now a third thing that I actually start with this one, uh, but I understand with the message that we've been preaching <laughs> that, that I've been talking about today, it was probably more understandable to start with praying for other people. But actually, when I pray, I start with this. Lord, can you bless me? I know it's weird. I know it's weird, but brothers and sisters, the way I've come to understand God's love, God's love does not just exist between you and God or you and another person. It is a circle. If you don't believe me, and and that circle needs to encompass God, it needs to encompass other people, it needs to encompass you. If you don't believe me, look at the two greatest commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. And love your neighbor, the other person, as yourself. So you're included in this too. So I know it seems kind of weird to pray for yourself. It seems unspiritual. I promise you it's not. Because if you don't love yourself, I don't know how you're going to love other people. If you can't forgive yourself, I don't know how you're going to forgive other people. This is probably one of the most important lessons I've learned. So brothers and sisters, maybe just for us right now, to pray, God, can you bless me? And maybe you can picture yourself smiling (laughs) and laughing and what you look like. I know it seems kind of weird, brothers and sisters, but so many of us, we just walk around with this face of defeat. We've just been walking around living half lives. We're just numb inside. Can you picture what you look like when you have joy? Because brothers and sisters, that's kind of love, the kind of love that God wants you to exist in. He wants to love you, and he wants to love the world. Because you are the world. You are the neighbor to someone else. And so yes, God does want to bless you. It just makes sense. He gave his life for the whole world. Jesus resurrected. He performed the most amazing miracle that humanity has ever known. He defeated death. And brothers and sisters, I know fear in many ways is just one shadow, one part of the fear of death. We don't love other people because in some ways we fear death. But Jesus has overcome that. So brothers and sisters, let's just take a moment and maybe pray, God, help me, empower me to be more like you, to love more like you. Maybe you just want to take a moment to just be still in that. It doesn't have to be a complicated prayer, brothers and sisters, but just create that room, that space. You know, for some of us, it is that work of repentance to, to, to admit, Lord, I haven't been loving in this way. I haven't loved myself in this way. I haven't loved other people. I haven't loved you as well as I should. And I just want to confess that. And I want to create the space for you to change some things in my heart, in my life, in my thoughts, in my emotions, in my behaviors. So can we do that? Can we just be open to what God wants to do? Let's just take a moment to let God work. It's not going to change everything in a moment, brothers and sisters. But the more we learn to do this, I know it will. So let's just be open right now in this moment, no time like the present. God, help me to be more like you.
Well, God, we thank you that you want to help us to be like your son. What a glorious life that was. In his death and his defeat of death, God, we saw his glory, we saw his love. And your son wanted us to love like that. God, I know there's some people in this room that that's really hard to do. Maybe for all the people in this room. We're not there yet. But God, we just want to simply declare, God, we want to create that openness for you to work. We want to increasingly become more like you. Lord, I pray for this congregation, not that they love perfectly uh, this week, because that's probably not going to happen, but that they more and more be conscious of how they can bless one another in their prayer life, in their simple actions every day. Help us to live into this value, into this new commandment you are giving us, to be the kind of people who love like Jesus, without condition, sacrificially, with all that we are, not just with action, but in spirit and truth, through and through, as a fully integrated human being that we can love like you. Thank you, Lord, for this invitation. Thank you, God, for this call to love like your son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.